Why do the rioters and anarchists feel so confident about doing this kind of thing, causing violence and destruction in U.S. cities? I thought we'd talk about that with Lieutenant Colonel James Carafano, who's an expert on national security and foreign policy challenges at Heritage Foundation. Uh, Colonel, it's good to have you back on the program. What do you make of all this? Well, I think it's it's eminently predictable. I, I just did a piece on this on Fox News about five reasons why Americans should be really worried. Because the reality is, is when state and local government fail to focus on public safety, they they create space for this to happen. And then you you, you, you have to worry not just about the, the organized criminal violence that's on the street, but then you have to worry that there are groups that, for them, Antifa is just not violent enough. You know, they're, they're just not pushing the agenda far enough. Or you have to worry about counter-extremists who say, well, this is my opportunity to go to the street, my justification for going that. And so violence begets violence. And, we, you know, we just saw that with a tragic shooting last night. And it, it, fundamentally, it is the fault of state and local officials who have failed to prioritize public safety over, over everything else. That's just... Well- well, and Colonel, one of the problems we've got is that virtually not every it's almost all the big cities in America are run by, in some cases, an entirely Democrat uh, and liberal point of view. The mayors, the city councils, the county commissions, in some cases, the state legislatures of entire states are run entirely from a liberal point of view. They're, they're not in favor of enforcing the law. And that is a that's a that's a in fact, it's a big difference in the presidential election. The president has been saying enforce the law and he's been doing it for months and saying, if you won't do it, I'll do it for you. I mean, uh, Joe Biden just now, just within the last short bit, uh, last couple of hours, has come out to condemn riots that have been going on in Kenosha for the last couple of nights, the last few nights and Sunday night, and uh, and the shooting of uh, uh, of the gentleman in uh, in uh, Kenosha, and they've been going on for months in other cities, and Joe Biden has been largely silent. I don't think he wants to speak out against it. So this does, to some extent, come down to a partisan a partisan divide, doesn't it? Well, here's how the politics have really created this, because you have incredibly weak leadership, particularly in cities like Portland and Seattle at the state and local level. And what what they've refused to do is they're so terrified about not being able to parse the difference between legitimate protests for racial equality and this violence that their that their default position is to do nothing. Well, the problem with that strategy is the organized criminal violence that is in the street. It is specifically designed to use the protests as a cover for their criminal activity. And, and so essentially they've created a permissive environment that has incentivized. And, and this is the thing is, you know, we're not seeing this in every city across the country. These guys are not stupid. They're going to the cities where they know they can get away with it, where they, a governor and where they refuse to act, where the district attorneys are activists themselves. And are so ingrained in the in the in this mission that they refuse to actually do their job and protect the law. This is the this is the greatest fascism of all. When you establish a personal moral authority that rises above the law, then you have created the ultimate fascist intent. And in fact, it affects everybody, including a lot of people who say, I live in a city because I want to be close to the things that you need to get by. A job, services, housing, streets, transportation, all those things. So once having gathered all those people there, when a crowd uh, uh, you know, is generated, and, it, and you're right, it's a great analysis and tell me if I'm getting you wrong when I say there are different actors within these crowds that all have a separate agenda, but their agendas happen to coincide into one direction. So the criminal crowd says, if we go down there, we can loot. The violent crowd that just wants to be violent, Antifa is a good example of that, they seem to like to you know, have a fight with whoever shows up. If an opposition group shows up, they have a fight. If the cops show up, they have a fight. If nobody shows up, they, they pick on whatever ordinary citizens wander by and those people get hurt so you have three different groups perhaps i don't know what their proportions are with three different agendas that just happen to coincide 
And uh, because the criminal group says if there's a massive group of people, some of them may be legitimate protesters who are just, you know, airing their grievances. Some of them are people who just want to be violent. But if you're in that kind of crowd, the police aren't going to notice your criminal acts. Well, and I, look, I don't mean this in a mean spirited way, but the protesters have become great enablers. They're on our yep. streets because they, are, they say we are fighting for people. But yet what they have done is create a condition where the victims are the people, the people that can't leave their homes, the businesses that are destroyed, the public services which are denied. So the very people they claim they're helping are the greatest victims of this. And the fact that the protest movement itself has not been able to disentangle, disentangle itself from organized criminal violence, I, I think it's a great indictment. And I think the other problem is, is we've had so many people stand up in empathy for, for a legitimate issue, for racial equality, legitimate issue, pour tens of millions of dollars into organizations that they have no idea where that money is going and what it's being used for. And when we see these violent criminal organizations and their people are immediately bailed out or are released without even being you know, charged, you have to ask is, if, I, if I'm a corporation and I gave millions of dollars to somebody, do I know where that money went and what it was used for? And if the whole idea was it's, it's for racial equality, well, how is burning our cities to the ground going to contribute to racial equality? It is literally the Roman, you know, the old Roman proverb. We created the desert and then we called it peace. I mean, that's what's going on here. Well, and Colonel Carafano, uh, just the other, I mean, since the shooting of Jacob Blake happened on Sunday night, about five o'clock local time in Kenosha, his family has come out and made appeals. We don't want to see this happen to to young men, uh, in particular, young black men in America. But they're already saying, we don't want you to burn the city down in name of Jacob Blake. But their appeals are falling on deaf ears, just as some of the appeals from the family of George Floyd fell on deaf ears. Because once the crowd gets ginned up, nothing seems to slow them down. Yeah, and, and I hate to say this, but this, this NBA, whatever it is, is, again, it's a great enabler. Essentially, they're encouraging people to go to the street and do more violence. And they say, well, we want justice. Well, justice is in a, a country that is ruled by law. Is there is an investigation. There's a presumption of innocence. There's equal protection under the law. And then people that broke the law are held accountable for that. That is how justice occurs. And it, it doesn't occur by people going to the streets and destroying things until they get what they want. And the NBA yeah. players essentially have sanctioned People burning that city to the ground. That's my takeaway from what they did. Well, and I have the same takeaway you did because there was a time, Colonel, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, 150, 200 years ago, when we did have mob justice. Something bad would happen. A mob would form. They demand that they wanted, they wanted somebody hanged for it. They wanted somebody jailed for it. They wanted somebody killed for it. And the mob got what it wanted. That is an ugly kind of justice that shouldn't be the rule uh, in the United States of America today. Yeah, you know, go 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 out and, and get the listen to the strong, strange fruit, fruit. You don't have to go 150 years ago. I mean, just decades ago in America, if we didn't like something, we would go out and we take a black person and we take them out and hang them. Yep. That was that was an, that was a, a concept of justice. We are angry and we are going to punish the people we want to punish. That is the behavior that we are enabling. And who's enabling it? Public officials, district attorneys, corporations, and you know, the, apparently the NBA, uh, and the protesters, and the protesting groups the same. All the people that say they're fighting for the people are making, are making, setting the people up as victims. That's right. And by the way, if you want to read a great essay about that, Mark Twain wrote one back in the day about a man who was hanged for no good reason. He wasn't the guilty party, but he was the person who was blamed by the mob, and he forfeited his life, and it was wrong then, and it's wrong today. Lieutenant Colonel James Carafano from the Heritage Foundation. Thanks very much, Colonel.